Okay. Okay. So, uh, inevitably, in any setting, when we look at, at research, we want to look at the importance of where that research is inevitably going to sit in a practical domain. Um, and, and in this in instance, we're looking at the importance of vision in football, but probably more realistically, we're looking at the importance of visual exploratory actions or what we would refer to as scanning uh, in a football setting. And just to give you an idea of what that's like, I've got uh, two videos here. The first is Javi. And as you can see, in this instance, he's scanning space before the ball is passed to him. He's controlling, passing the football. As soon as he's passed the ball, again, he's scanning space to see where a defender is, his teammates, opponents in space. Again, scanning just before the ball is passed back to him. And then even while the ball is on its way to him, he's scanning again. So he's constantly moving his head to try and gain a massive understanding of what's happening uh, within that actual game setting. And then he's making a final pass to the ball before he inevitably moves on. Another great example of this uh, comes from Frank Lampard, who is often talked in the same class or field as Xavi as a player who can pass the ball. And again, some fantastic examples of his visual exploratory actions in this video, constantly looking around, trying to gain as much information from the environment as he can before he moves forward and passes the ball off. Um, I think one of the, the common things that comes up when commentators or when coaches discuss these players is that the importance of their ability to scan the pitch and take in as much information as they can. And they're often referred to as players who are able to have more time on the ball than others. But in reality, it's how they use their attention and that time is what gives them the time and space. It gives them a better understanding of their spatial awareness and it allows them to make better decisions based on the ball coming towards them. Um, from an academic perspective, we refer to this as visual exploratory actions. Uh, and visual exploratory actions or scanning can play a significant role in heads of football. Uh, there's been some very interesting research done in visual exploratory actions. And one of the lead researchers in this area, uh, to name just a, one of a few, is Thomas McGuckian. Uh, and he's produced a number of studies through 2018 through to 2020. And what he's identified is that we can break visual exploratory actions into two components. We can look at head turn frequencies and head turn excursions. So when we talk about head turn frequencies, we're talking about the number of times you rotate your head from left to right in an essence. Um, and then when we talk about head turn excursions, we're talking about the extent to which you're rotating your head. So a small excursion of the head would just be this, and then a large excursion would be much more vivid turn of the head, similar to what we would have seen Lampard doing in that video previous to that. The important part of this research is that it's given us a very good understanding of the link between visual exploratory actions and performance. Uh, and from a, a number of key messages that come from some of the research that Thomas McGuckin has conducted uh, in an 11 v 11 game setting is that an increase in head turn frequencies and head turn excursions occurs as the ball starts to arrive at the player's feet. And that's in a two to nine second barrier. It's also identified that head turn frequencies prior to receiving the ball is strongly linked not only to the speed of a pass, but also to the direction of a pass. And when you're looking at players like Javi and Lampard, who often were able to find a pass through a defense, it's no surprise that an increase in visual exploratory actions or scanning resulted in a higher chance of the pass of football moving forward. Uh, and a, a good indication of that is uh, our friend Donald Duck here, who, as you can see, is viciously turning his head from left to right. And in a game setting, he's going to be trying to absorb as much information from the environment as he possibly can. The key thing and why this leads to, to some of the research that we've conducted that I'm going to discuss now is that if we know how important visual exploratory actions are, how can we start to train our players to get to using this particular skill in a better manner? So for us, we started uh, with a paper that was published in Science and Medicine of Football in 2019, uh, and we were focused on the impact of a training intervention with spatial occlusion goggles, which in this essence is the chin-up goggles, on controlling and passing a football. We had a significant caveat within that, and that was that we were using visual attention as one of our key performance variables. The study design was quite simple. We used a pre-test, a training intervention, a post-test, and then a retention test. Uh, and we had three groups. One group 
wore the chin-up goggles for the duration of the training intervention. One group was a practice group who did everything that the chin-up goggles group would have, conduct, would have done throughout the testing and training. And one group was a control group who, all, who only ever did the, um, the testing phases. So to give you a brief idea of what that study looked like, I'll show you this brief video. So beginning with a number display task, which is the visual task, we fed balls into a projection machine at three, four or five second intervals, trying to avoid a predictable delivery and stop participants getting into a rhythm of knowing when the ball was going to come to them. The participants were then allowed to self-select how they control the football. And following on from that, they passed the ball to the goal on the left or the right. Now that was indicated by a directional arrow which appeared on the number call uh, task that I'll explain in a little bit more detail now. So throughout that testing session and also what would have been the training intervention, we had three performance variables that we looked at. The visual number call task always started with a five second countdown. And as you can see, the numbers were in red to differentiate for participants when they were off and when they were on. The numbers then started to appear every half a second in large white uh, numbers on the screen. And the participants had to call every number that appeared. Every three, four or five seconds, there'd be an arrow displayed to the left or the right, which indicated direction of the uh, pass. The main reason we used the visual number call was to give us an indication of how much visual attention the players could dictate towards the screen up in front of them while they were controlling and passing a football. And next performance variable was inevitably control accuracy which was identifying if participants could control the ball with one touch for passing it with their second. If they took more than one touch of the football, it would have been a control error, or if they missed the football entirely, it would have been a control error. And then we had passing accuracy, which was selecting the correct pass to the right goal and making the pass go between the two goals, essentially. So what we found for the group that practiced with the chin-up goggles is that they significantly reduced their number call error which means they were able to identify far more of the numbers that were displayed on the screen at the time. Uh, we also found that their passing accuracy significantly improved and that there was no change in their control accuracy. What's important about these results is that none of these uh, changes were experienced for the practice group or the control group across the post-test or the retention test. So if we can guide visual attention upwards towards a secondary task, such as the visual call task we used in that study, we wanted to know if we could guide visual attention uh, to the movements of teammates and opponents in a more applied setting. So that question essentially led us to our second study in football, which would have been the third study in my PhD. Uh, and this study assessed the impact of spatial occlusion training, again, on pass accuracy across a continuum of representative experimental designs in football. Again, we used a very similar study design However, there's a number of key differences that I'll point out. So we used a pre-test, a training intervention, a post-test and a retention test, similar to the previous study. Again, in phase one and phase two of this study, we had the similar groupings of a chin-up goggles group, a practice group and a control group. And then in phase three, we implemented a training intervention and the testing with a football team as part of their normal training routine. So they were tested, we embedded the intervention in their normal training, and then they were post-tested and retention tested after that. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you a brief outline of what the study design looked like. So phase one was quite simple. As you can see at the top of that image, you have a teammate whose role it was is to pass the ball to the participant who would be wearing the goggles during the intervention. As the ball was passed in, it broke a timing gate system. The participant had to control and pass the ball back to the teammate depending on their run, be that to the left or to the right. So once the ball was passed out, the timing gate system was broken again, which would have given us a response time variable. The second phase of this study, which was run with a separate cohort of participants, was very similar to the first phase. First phase excuse me. The teammate again had to pass the ball to the participant, and the role of the participant was to return the pass to the teammate, be that if they ran to the left or the right. However, in this phase, we introduced a decoy runner. And the purpose of introducing a decoy runner was to identify if, yes, participants could get their head up and identify movement in front of them, but could they differentiate between a teammate and potentially an, op an opponent uh, when we come to the field of play? 
For phase one and phase two of this study design, the testing phase and the intervention phase are the same, but as I alluded to earlier, they were split up into three groups. Again, our chin-up goggles group, our practice group, who would have done everything the chin-up goggles group did without the goggles, and a control group who only took part in the testing phases. And then after that, we had our third phase. And this phase was implemented with a university soccer team who were performing at the highest uh, level in university sports. And in this phase, we added the introduction of a pressure runner. So again, the teammate and the decoy runner had the same role as they would have had in phase one and phase two. However, the role for the pressure runner was to run directly at the participant after the ball had been passed to him and try and actively put pressure on, but not tackle the participant before they played their return pass. Again, in this uh, phase, the participants went through four sessions over a two week period of a training intervention. In that first session, they did the exact same intervention that the participants in phase one conducted. In the second session, they did the exact same uh, training intervention that participants in phase two had done. However, we changed the uh, style of um, session for, phase, for session three and session four. So in session three, as you can see, there's participants who would wear the occlusion goggles on the outside of an 11 by 11 meter grid. And then within that, there's a 10 by 10 meter grid where you have three players. There's a teammate for each participant on the outside, and then we have a joker. And the role of the joker in this situation was to essentially be a teammate for the team in possession. And what that did was it created a two on one in the center and essentially a three on two on the outside while the team were in play. And again, the participants on the outside were instructed to control and pass the ball back into a teammate as soon as they possibly could. And again, for the session four, we added an additional person into that layer where you had a two on two on the inside grid. And when you include the participants wearing the goggles on the outside, we had a three on three. Our performance variables in this study were quite similar to that of the first study. However, this time we had a response time, which is indicated by the time it took for the ball to come through the timing gate to go back out on the return pass. We had passing accuracy, which was to accurately pass the ball through a set of cones to the teammate based on the direction they had run. And then we have control accuracy, which was again, very similar to the control accuracy variables we talked about in study two. Again, for the results, the chin-up goggles um, were quite convincing in the fact that we had a significant increase in pass accuracy for the groups who practiced with the chin-up goggles and the team who practiced with the chin-up goggles in phase three. We had a significant decrease in response time, so they were able to pass the ball faster than they initially had in the pretest. And again, we saw no significant change in control accuracy. One of the reasons we potentially saw no change in control accuracy across the study is that um, participants were allowed to self-select how they control the football. So we didn't put a very significant volume of restraints on that particular variable. So if we know that chin-up goggles following a training intervention can guide your visual attention upwards and we can identify the movements of teammates and, and opponents, how can we maximize the practical applications of the goggles in training? One of the ways we can do that is by understanding the relationship between task difficulty and the potential for learning within our training design. Something we see quite frequently is this image that I've uh, put on the screen now, and that's a simple one-to-one -one passing drill where the two players have got no opponents there, there's very little potential for learning and the task difficulty is quite low. Even if we were to include the goggles in this situation, players at that level are likely to not be under a significant amount of pressure and they're not significantly gonna learn an awful lot. And if we train participants or players in this setting, we can't exactly expect them to perform passes like this where there's teammates playing, or teammates on the move, uh, opponents trying to uh, create pressure and always somebody looking to close down an angle. So what we would suggest from a chin-up goggles training perspective is that you use possession-based small set of games. So as you can see in the image on the left, you would have somebody wearing the chin-up goggles on the top and the bottom of that particular uh, possession game. And then within that, you can have a 2v2, 3v3, or if you wanted to manipulate your task difficulty, you could have a 2v1 or a 1v2, or a 4v2 or a 2v4. So you're either adding difficulty or reducing difficulty based on the level of your player at the time. Now what's important about this is that the players with the chin-up goggles are only working in a 190 degree uh, zone. So they're only really playing what's in front of them. Uh, and because of that, we would then suggest that you start to increase the level of difficulty in some of the games that you're playing, or you may even start at this level. And one way you can do that 
is by putting the player with the chin-up goggles in a 360 degree passing environment where you're uh, essentially utilizing a normal uh, game which will have to flow from end to end. Now, there's a couple of important considerations you need to be aware of from this perspective, and that's over constraining the session design. And there's a number of things I want to just touch on in relation to this. Um, one of those is that if you force the play in small set of games through the person in the middle, you're not allowing for the game to naturally occur as it typically would. So instead of forcing the ball through the middle of the field, we would suggest that you incentivize the pass through the middle through the person who's wearing the chin-up goggles in the fact that if the team score at the opposite end and the ball goes through the center, then you can work off at two points awarded for that goal instead of one. Similar to that, it's always important to allow play to develop. Uh, and although you had players like Matt Letizia who could control and pass the ball and was able to admire it afterwards, it's not quite common for players to constantly be able to do that. Um, and this came from a conversation with a number of coaches and a number of academics in the perspective of if you have a player in the middle who's playing and you want them to be able to allow to develop with the game, one of the key things you need to do is tell them to just take the goggles off after, after they've received and passed the football. That way they can continue and join the play as it naturally would, so they're not standing and watching the, the play unfold as it may be. Uh, another thing to take note of here is that it's not just the game that you design, but how you implement the, the tool, such as chin-up goggles, is important. If you ask players to dribble while they're wearing the chin-up goggles, you're kind of defeating the purpose of this task. They're not fit for purpose in a dribble sequence, but they are fit for purpose when you're working on one or two touch passing or even three touch passing in these style games. It's also really important to understand that you need to create a space barrier for the players wearing the occlusion goggles or the chin-up goggles, sorry. And the reason for that is if you allow teammates to get too close and they're passing the ball to the player with the chin-up goggles on, and they can no longer see the hips, they can no longer see the foot or the standing planting leg, you're removing too much information from that player's field of vision, and they're going to lose too much and then it'll inevitably create a problem rather than be a benefit. Now, one thing that uh, is very pertinent about this is that this game design is designed for a central midfielder in mind, uh, but you can also design it for a left back and a right back where the manipulation of the space is a little bit different, or a left midfielder or a right midfielder again, based on what you're looking for your individual players. And be sure to, to, to encourage them to, once they've received them past the ball, to whip the goggles off their head, join the play, and then you can reset, they can put the goggles back on. And that way you're not over constraining the game too much. A key question I always get asked when discussing the goggles is, how difficult should practice be? Uh, and the thing I always suggest is that you uh, find the appropriate challenge point for your players. And I've got some nice videos to demonstrate this, albeit that they're not very much soccer related or football related. Now, I'm not sure if you can hear that, but that was a significant thud. And I would suggest that that task difficulty is way too high for somebody of that level. In the same sense, if you're working with young academy players and you put them in a 360 degree game and you're encouraging them to scan the field and they're still struggling and keeping their head up, you may be creating a task difficulty that's too hard for those particular players. In another sense, you could have players who are well capable of performing the task you ask them to perform, such as this man. Now, while he does his second flip in slow motion, it's important to point out that in this setting, he may have performed the flip very well, but there are elements of it that he may be able to improve on. So again, you need to adjust the task difficulty based on the person in front of you. And one thing that always sits well on me is the Goldilocks effects. The Goldilocks effect is that the challenge is not too difficult or too light or too easy, uh, excuse me, that the task difficulty is just right. But that, again, is dependent on the individual in front of you. There are a couple of things that I just want to address, and this comes from a number of conversations with uh, additional coaches and practitioners. Who, wear the, who use the goggles uh, and have said, oh, you know, we use them, but we didn't really feel they worked all that well uh, or mistakes happened. Uh, and the first thing to acknowledge is that mistakes will occur when you're wearing the chin-up goggles. Uh, I would hope that it's not in the game, like this poor goalkeeper had, um, where he's completely missed the ball and he thought he's passing the forward and the ball's gone under his foot. Um, but when they're wearing the goggles, you are going to see mistakes and that's not an issue. Another point is that players will inevitably look down. And this work isn't suggesting that you stop your players from looking down. It's just about guiding their visual attention to 
towards more pertinent information in the environment while they're playing the game. Um, and like the studies have identified, the benefits of the goggles don't come while they're on. The benefits of the goggles come after you've taken them off. Um, and then just to kind of get close to wrapping things up, why we use perceptual training or perceptual cognitive training was summed up very well in a tweet by Rob Gray. And that is that the goal of perceptual cognitive training in sports shouldn't be to try and improve your general processor in your head uh, because there's no evidence that this transfers and there's a lot of uh, devices out there that, that particularly focus in on that. Instead, we want to constrain to educate attention to different information sources. And that's something that the chin of goggles, if you use them correctly, do very, very well. Uh, just to finish up, uh, firstly, thank you all for, for logging in and listening and thank you uh, to James for having me on. Um, if you have any questions in relation to the research that I've conducted or questions about your own uh, practice that we don't get to today, my email is alan.dunton at tudublin.ie uh, and I'm also on Twitter relatively actively, um, so it's at Alan Dunton and then obviously there's some other contact uh, information there for Ed and there's also contact information for Chin Up Goggles if that's something that you want to pursue after that. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you, and I will stop sharing my screen just about now. Great, Alan, thank you so much. Um, that was great. That was a, a, a nice recap. Uh, although I'm very familiar with the work, it, it was it's always great to hear it, and especially with the the practical the practical space in mind. Um, I have a few questions actually that were sent in beforehand um, because I, I know James had asked about that. So as I said in the chat box, guys, I'm going to get to them first. And of course, keep um, your own your own questions coming in. Um, lovely timing too. We have about 30 minutes to go. So we've got we've got some time to get into some questions and answers. So the one of the first questions I have Al, um, is how do you infuse the second study into a normal practice session? So this is obviously someone who's aware of your work. Um, so let's say from a, it's from a guy called Peter Mack. Uh, it, from a normal a normal training session, let's say, and a team is, is looking in here and they're saying, uh, yeah, I've seen that work, I've seen what it does. How would I infuse the goggles into a regular training session? That's not, an, let's say, I'm assuming what, by what he's saying here, not a, not an empirical setting, like a study setting like you, you've described. Any ideas on that? Yeah, um, some, of the, some of the examples I put there from the, the slides would go a long way to identifying how you can use that. The first thing is understanding your players, but I think if I actually go to the empirical work, we implemented the goggles for uh, 10 minutes in two minute bouts at the start of the training session with the soccer team. So that would have been phase three of that study. And it implemented quite well. Um, a lot of the coaches had no issue with that time. And as somebody who, who does research, you're aware that time for, for these kind of tools and sessions is, is quite difficult, but they're so easily applied um, that you can really integrate them at the start of a session for 10 minutes, or they can be implemented when you're trying to make a point or you're trying to emphasize particular scanning behaviors throughout the theme of a session. Um, so they're quite easy to implement uh, and they don't need to be worn for an entire session. You can wear them for two minute bouts, have a little bit of rest and then integrate them with the remainder of the session. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Um, and again, guys, this isn't, this isn't a closed shop here. If there's someone who wants to contribute an idea in, again, uh, from my understanding and from looking at the people involved here, we're all coaches. So, uh, I, I think I'd speak for both Alan and myself. We're not standing here with all the answers. We're, what we are saying, though, is we, we, we want to engage with you guys just as much. So please chip in with an idea if you have it. Uh, I will just jump into a question that Nick Hill is, it has, has offered in. And it's brilliant to have somebody like Nick Hill on here. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know him, worth a, worth a follow on Twitter. A hugely experienced uh, coach himself. Uh, so thanks, Nick, for, for, for joining us. Um, have you had any traction from the field of rugby in Munster? Um, and what do you think about goggles with small holes in them that reduce the field of view? Will they produce similar results to you, do you think? Uh, do you want to take that or will I? Uh, that's up to you, Ed. Uh, I, I know in particular, and I, I'll address the first part first, because I know, I know you've had a, a bit of dealings with Munster from a different perspective that we can we can talk to afterwards. But to address, I think, rugby as a, as a game as a whole, a lot of rugby is played in a higher level than soccer would be. Um, so for a lot of the skills of rugby, they may not apply very well because you may not be including any information at all. Um, however, when you get to one-on-one -on -one situations with defenders trying to place a tackle on somebody trying to get past them, 
or in another aspect of a player trying to get around the defender, they can guide your visual attention towards that central trunk region. Mm. And that particular area is massively informative in terms of the direction that a player is going to go or the direction that somebody's trying to make a tackle in. So they can work in guiding the visual attention there in that aspect. Um, but again, yeah, I think if you want to jump in and take over for your aspect on that. Yeah, I think I think that's a very good point that you made there um, about the, that, that that trunk region, and I think that's where Nick Winkleman, who's who is the head of athletic performance and science for the IRFU, he we've we've shown Nick these over the years, and he really likes them to be perfectly honest. And that was the one thing that jumped out at Nick was for the use, as as Alan said, they, rugby happens up at a higher level, visual level. Let's say the ball is passed across around chest height and so on and so forth. So from a passing perspective, less so. But I think one of the things that Nick uh, alluded to, which Alan has mentioned, is is from a, a an anticipation perspective for trying to read a direction that a player is going to go, if they're trying to sidestep or not. If they're, how, are they, how are they going to, you know, when they dip their hips, what are the advanced postural cues that a player will give away that will help another player, an opposition player, anticipate the, the movement that's about to follow? So I think that's that that's something from a, a rugby perspective that has ha, that has that has definitely been seen. The other little bit of work that we saw we we did with Monster Rugby going back a while, and I do like the way you 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 met you you mentioned in your question, Nick, is about traction. Um, traction is a is a funny thing to get with any team because if the person who you're working with, um, you're get, developing traction with somebody. And then they leave and go to another team. <laughs> Traction is very hard to keep going. Now, having said that, even with the, the goggles, we had a couple of uh, bits of traction over the years, but people kept moving to different jobs. But one, one particular way was in the rehab setting. And the goggles were used for a period of time working with people with lower limb injuries, where they were at the advanced stage of their rehabilitation, where the goggles would have been applied for, uh, to them to um to occlude their stepping motion so that they weren't it was to try and encourage them to still be looking out and to engage more proprioceptive properties in the movement and not be looking down and minding their footfall let's say so they also started looking at even things about stepping off different height steps without the players knowing was it four inches six inches eight inches with the goggles on and again to infuse some um some basically some better um, applied use of it, but also to take away the feed forward mechanism that often happens with athletes uh, at a, an advanced rehab stage. Um, what about decisions? I'm going to stay with, with Nick, guys, and I'll come back up to the other questions. Um, what about decision making and seeing gaps to attack? Possibly, um, but again, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure if the goggles would fit that. And I think that's something that, in fairness, over the years, Alan, I know in conferences around the world, in fact, he's been quite strong on making sure that, you know, we're, we're not saying that these, these goggles are a panacea and a cure-all for everything. Used in the right way, they're, they're, we've shown them to be quite effective. I'm not too sure, again, because of the field of vision in rugby, as far as that, uh, they are for low-level visual stream uh, type work. But it's one, it's one to, it's worth, it's worth a look, Nick, to be honest. It's a, it's a good question in that regard. It's always, uh, always those kind of questions are good ones to, to probe, let's say. Um, okay, and the next question in, and again, I'll come back to the questions I pre that, that I had sent in earlier, um, but I'll, I'll go to these. Uh, ben Franks, oh, great to have you on, Ben. Uh, another good guy, in fact, to, to follow on Twitter, Twitter, if anyone doesn't know him, uh, Ben. Um, is 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 a guy who's heavily involved with uh, our friends in the states, uh, Sean Mishka and Tyler Yearby in the emergent um, the emergent academy, the movement academy over there. Um, so good to have you on, Ben. I hope you're well. Um, hi, Ed, Alan, and Ed. Always a treat hearing you discuss your work. Thanks. Um, apologies if I missed, but in terms of retention and transfer across longer time scales, good question. This um, and periodizing skill training. Did you get much insight into this in an empirical or experiential? perspective good question uh Al? yeah great question um and congratulations on the the launch of that program you put out ben um looks to be a very interesting one uh, in terms of retention and transfer uh from a research perspective first we had two day and two week retention tests uh through our studies um again with the difficulties of research we didn't go beyond that 
but there was a significant retention after two weeks. Um, so that, that's that's from an empirical standpoint, all I can really say from there. Uh, from an experiential standpoint and having been involved with, with teams that have used them, they do seem to transfer quite well um, for longer time periods. Um, but I can't give you a definitive answer on how long that may be. I think the the implicit nature of them would suggest that they could do uh, they could embed quite well from a longer term learning perspective, um, and to a transfer under pressure perspective in the game. Um, if that answers your question, but I'm happy to to jump forward and back with you on that one if you want to unmute our running along lines of that. And if I may add, there actually, Al, I think because it, it, it's a great question. I think empirically we've shown some some uh, retention transfer, but I also think I remember Zoe Wims. We were speaking to Zoe, who a lot of people on here would know, and from her work and the work she does in visual training. And um, one of the things that Zoe said is, it, they might be the type of device might because we don't know, we didn't look at it. That that might require, depending, you know, because behavior change is quite difficult, as we all know. It takes a while for behaviors to really bed in that a bit of maintenance work. And I think as you were mentioning there um, yourself about periodizing, let's say the skill that it might be for an intense period of time initially to try and uh, in, in, impact on a current behavior. And then it might need topping up, let's say. That would be from, a, from an anecdotal perspective is how I might see something like that happening, that you would touch base back, you, you would touch base with them again in a more period, in a periodical way. But again, we don't have evidence and I, I think just to even dovetail on top of that, Ed, I think it's Fabian uh, Ote, and I've probably butchered his name there, um, who does some fantastic research uh, on skill periodization. But he, I think he even makes a suggestion of having the, the, the more difficult cognitive work earlier in the week. And then as the week moves on, you reduce that cognitive load on the players as they go towards a, a game day. So even week to week, you could potentially implement it in that aspect um, if you're looking at it from a top-up perspective. Yeah, cool. And again, look, just let me know, uh, Ben, if you want to, if you want to jump in, I can unmute you and stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Okay. Um, next up, and the great lads, guys, uh, thank you so much for the engagement. The questions are, are fantastic. Moving down here to um, Pedro Estevez and, and Pedro, I know you got in touch beforehand as well with James. So, so great to, to great to have you on here. Uh, congratulations for your interesting presentation. I would like to share with you some challenges in view of your and sensibility and expertise on the area. How do you conceive the instruction to the use of these goggles? Yeah, very good. Good question. We'll get to that. And did you notice any differential impact on the use of the goggles in terms of different patterns of perception, information, and action and the ball control? Cool, good question. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just so, so I'm clear on the first part of the question, how do you conceive the instruction to the use of these goggles, as, as in how do you layer instruction with the goggles, or are you talking about from a, a perspective of, yeah, of general construct. instruction? He's yeah, saying I mean, about task instruction, I suppose the, 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 guide, the guiding principles on how they should be used and letting people know, I suppose, beforehand. Yeah, I think the, the design of the, the environment that you embed the goggles in is probably the most important aspect of that. Um, we gave very little instruction from a verbal instruction and feedback perspective um, because we wanted to, to allow the goggles to have as an implicit an effect as they could. Um, so the, again, any tool that you use is only gonna be as good as the environment in which you sit it in. Um, so for us, what we found from the goggles perspective is that if you try to engage them in a dribbling task or you try to engage them in a more fluid free-flowing game they start to remove too much information we did quite a lot of pilot work on that so we very much would um, manipulate the the game design to being that one or two touch and then you can from a practical perspective you can take the goggles off and re-engage in the game because they're easy to slip on and off and um, so that's how we would use them from that perspective um, and any differential impact on the use of the goggles in terms of patterns of perception um, and action on ball control. I think actually, and, and it's anecdotal rather than uh, anything we record in particular, but early on, some of the players tend to use the bottom of their foot to control the ball. And that tends to dissipate as they get more familiar with using the goggles. 
Um, so from a ball control perspective, that was one of the things we saw early, but that didn't, and, and this is anecdotal, that did not reoccur from a, a post-test or attention test perspective. Um, and then in terms of patterns of perception, uh, it was gen genuinely the, the more heads up and chin up approach from a, pers from a perceptive perspective. Um, and again, depending on how you design your session, in order to create more head turn frequencies to the left or to the right, that's very much in how you design the game. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, if, if I may add in there to it, just going back to the conversation I had with Rick Shuttleworth um, in 2018 at our first conference at Movement Skill Acquisition in Ireland, he, he liked, he, he said what you said, Al, very little instruction, allow the goggles do what they do, you know, allow them be a constraint in the environment. If people, as he was saying, they should, if they are fitted, if they if they fit well, and they they just sit around the face, let's say, um, well then you it the, it will encourage people to be looking outward as opposed to down because you can't look down, and if you actually are able to see your feet, then you're looking so far down you can see nothing else. So, I think his his comment to us was as little instruction as possible and allow them to be a constraint on the behaviour that will that will emerge. Let's say. Um, Okay, Pedro. Again, if there's more to come from you, let just 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 chip back in, and if you feel that we, we there's more to offer, uh, John Connolly, thanks for contributing. Uh, how early would you recommend introducing these to players? Uh, is it skill led once they possess the ability to pass? A oh, good question. Or age led when they've cognitive ability to process the constraints? That's a good question. Uh, Great uh, question. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. I think I, I'm not sure the the impact the goggles would have in terms of a, a very young athlete self organizing to control the ball if they couldn't see the ball, um, and it's not something I've experimented with. So that's a that's a that's an absolute great question. Um, I'd be very interesting to see what would happen. You just you. Um, just you just created a postdoc. Uh, I was going to say <laughs> you just created postdoc research because we we as you said uh, we don't know I suppose you know because the cohort we were working with were all we're all adults and even when the applied said they're all adults and even in the practical space that we've used them in basketball and soccer and hockey like I, I, they've been used in, in field hockey quite a bit I've used them quite a bit with with goalkeepers in field hockey and in hurling um, and camogie but they're all adults. Yeah. They're, adults in fact uh, i think that the the significant difference there from a basketball perspective that they, they are used from a much younger mm -hmm. age because the haptic sense through the hand is far more heightened than the haptic sense through the foot so that's your sense of feel through your hand is way more increased than it will be through your foot especially through a shoe and um, so from a basketball perspective i would i would have no problem in saying as earlier as you would like them to be, or as young as, well, not as young, but from a very young age, from a, a soccer perspective, from ball control, only because I know that we were working with players who had the ability to control the ball, that I would say that that's a, a very important element, but I would love to see how, player, how young players self-organize uh, when they can't see their feet. Yeah. Yeah, watch this space. We'll be putting up an advertisement soon, guys, for a new PhD and looking at the, the age and stage suitability for the use of occluding goggles in soccer. Um, great question, John. Uh, great, great question. question. Um, makes sense. That, and, uh, link to the periodizing skill training. Nick, back in. Thanks, man. Uh, do you have a scheme of work, progression of exercises as how... Um, uh, how Oh, sorry, just lost there. So progression of exercise as how many coaches actually teach coach vision training links to any resources. Good question. Yeah, I definitely have. I don't, I don't know from a scheme of work perspective, I have links to resources on, on how you can approach or coaches can approach vision training. I think it's one of the more divided fields, if I may, mm -hmm. from that perspective, because you have quite a lot of tools that are designed to work on what I'd refer to as the the visual hardware so what's your peripheral vision like what's your um uh, have you got 20, 20 vision or not whereas I would look at them very much as a more of a software tool um and vision training should be more of a software element and let me clarify what I mean by that 
terms of that you need to be able to embed your vision training as close to the game as possible. Um, I And I think that tweet from Rob kind of mm. uh, maximizes that a little bit more. Vision training uh, is more around the visual exploratory actions rather than vision itself for me. And, and I'm, I'm happy to, to have a, a discussion with anybody who would potentially think otherwise. But for me, it has to be encompassing to head movement, to body movement, to position on the court or field of play. Um, because that information is the most pre prevalent information that players are going to have to work from. Um, so I think you could probably be dipping into underpinning theories from that perspective, Nick. Um, but I can send you the content I have uh, around that. Just if I may again, um, Nick, and I, you, I know you, you, you know this guy, but just for anyone else, Check out Rob Gray's Perception Action podcast, guys. He's on he's on uh, Twitter at Shaky Weights. Um, but if you just do Perception Action podcast, he has some exceptional episodes in his podcasts about the different types of cognitive training. Let's say from a, a vision training or even some of the more um, exploratory forms of training around, let's say, Dynavision and and. Um, uh, point light display training uh, uh, capacities, let's say, you know, uh, some of the things from NeuroTracker and the things. And he does a really nice job of putting both sides of the argument forward for these types of training uh, processes. But I know one of them in particular, he, he does some nice work about how, how do we apply this and how do we phase this type of work in or out of a training program for an athlete. Um, unfortunately, I don't have it to hand exactly which episode it is, but probably not not too far back. I, I, it's probably in the last maybe 20 or 20 or 25 episodes um, on, on Rob's podcast. Um, OK, moving on. And again, if, if, if people want to come back in with additional questions on a particular topic, please do. Uh, Philip O'Callaghan, is there any research on the use of the goggles in, te in tennis or any other racket sport? Would the main use in tennis be picking up the advanced postural cues when returning serve? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so from the, 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 the simple answer is from the goggles perspective, there isn't. But occlusion research on a whole has is almost embedded in tennis and cricket. Um, and from the early work in tennis, it very much looked at temporally occluding the, the entire visual field to see if players could essentially identify from early on in the tennis serve the particular cues that were most relevant to returning a serve. Um, as the research has kind of progressed from there, there's there's far more of an emphasis now on online control or perspective control um, instead of predictive control, where the suggestion would be that the advanced postural cues on their own were potentially overstated. Um, and now there's a lot more that feeds into that general environment um, so it's, it's about, and, and this is where the constraining to educate attention is, is quite important from a temporal occlusion perspective when you remove the entire scene. If you're not guiding the attention or the attention to anything in particular, you may not see any improvements, um, but there's, there's quite a lot of debate around how much you can get from a temporal occlusion perspective as opposed to a spatial occlusion kind of a paradigm. Um, but you can layer all of these with implicit cues to, to try and heighten that, I suppose. I'm, I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, Phil, but you can use the goggles to start to focus, especially younger players' attention towards those cues, because if they're not picking them up, then they need to start picking them up. Um, but it's about not removing what comes next in terms of the return of serve. I, th I think also probably, and you're probably aware of the research, Philip, by this, by the yeah, I would say so. question, but just in case not, and again, for anybody else, check out David Broadbent's work uh, from the work that he's doing in that type of space with tennis and the challenge point theory um, from Brunel and also Colin Murphy's work with the research group in, in St. Mary's. Um, St. Mary's, isn't he, isn't he Al? He, Colin mm -hmm. is there. Um, so yeah, uh, again, a couple of guys that we would know that are have particularly looked at decision making and things like this in 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 tennis, albeit in a different way, 
in more lab based work and so on and so forth. But still, there are contributions that they that their work has found that has definitely impacted on some practitioners that I know. Um, so yeah, it's just another couple of guys to check in. Just with. sorry, just a note on that that last point. You need to be very aware of the distance that you're getting them to pick cues up from, uh, Phil. So if the distance is too far away and the occlusion period is it isn't even hitting the net, then it's unlikely that you're going to guide visual attention to what they really need to see. So you may have to close that space quite significantly and start with them moving left or right in terms of an initial step to returning the serve. And then you can start to bring them back out from there. And But that is important to be aware of. Okay, cool. And uh, moving on, uh, Pedro has come back in. Um, what about the potential complementary role of using the goggles and educating the attention of the players into relevant areas of the game environment? Nice. Yeah, that's. I think that's a great question as well. And I think that's definitely one to, to look towards. Um, both that and understanding the tactical um, needs of a particular team. So it's one that I've discussed with from a coach's perspective if they have a particular style of play that they want their players to work through, you can use the goggles and layer them with tactical information to start to advance the thinking around what the player's next couple of steps are. Because I think one of the areas where you may see a, a an issue is if you only use them for a control and pass and then you remove the follow-up series of events of play and that's where that tactile um, and relevant areas of the game environment would start to feed into a far more inclusive use of the goggles. Yeah, cool. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, Nick, thanks for coming in. Uh, DM games, yeah, that would be great. Phasing in things, yeah, that's the big thing. That's the big thing with any with any uh, skill device. Phasing it in and phasing it out. It's not that these replace things. It's that these are to enhance possible properties of engagement. Um, not to replace them, but to improve them weird question oh yes hopefully we love weird questions um weird question but does the weather play in any role when using the goggles are they as effective when it is raining as when it is sunny <laughs> so that might suggest to me that you haven't seen them and you if you saw them you would in fact if you saw my bag of goggles and um, that i've have in the, in the in the boot of the car you'd realize yeah they cut they be they're incredibly robust because it's a plastic it's a plastic uh, front that just is very soft plastic that just goes around the and with the, a large band that goes around the head and adjustable band, and they you could wear them in absolutely any weather because they are not in any way um, they're not breakable. I don't we we still haven't come across a broken pair, have we? For no. all the, the the trials and tribulations we put them through, um, because they're not. It's, there's nothing in them that's breakable. Really, it, it's 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 a very soft. It's a pliable plastic with the with the band around the back. Um, so, so yeah, um, someone asked us one time, have you ever, have we ever used them with swimming? I was like, yeah, you definitely haven't seen these goggles because there's, there's no glass or anything. <laughs> um, you know, this, these aren't for underwater uh, ladders or anything. Um, um, but yeah, so, so to answer your question, yeah, absolutely. Just as effective in the, in the weather, weather has no impact on, on, on the use of these. Um, Nick, again, nice one. Uh, I am right to think. Um, that they'd be useful when defending a one-on-one -on -one and tracking back to see which direction an attacker would sidestep, therefore to help them tackle better in a real game. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. That's mainly that, that, where I'd have used them in evasion kind of yeah. stuff. And that's where the boys of Munster were telling us too. That's that that's where they were seen um in our in our, you know, in, in the in the few times that we engaged with them on it, uh, albeit with different people, but there was always interest because they were like, actually, this is nice for that kind of close contact being able to read the cues and, and being able to pick up quickly earlier um, somebody's uh, uh, intention of, of direction that they're going to go in. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, really get, uh, thanks. Uh, jo uh, Joby Costello, goalkeeping coach, is unable to send in a question, Oh, uh, that's, uh, but has messaged me to say he uses them with uh, his kids from 12 to 18. Oh, cool. Uh, thanks, James. Um, that's good. Uh, oh, he's here himself. Our goalkeeping clinic uh, coach, goalkeeping us uh, the uh, the goggles uh, with the twelve to eighteen rolls, and they love them and they work really well. Oh, cool! That's some nice feedback. Um, thanks, Joby. Let's appreciate that. And I, Actually, I can see it. Look, I've used them myself with 
with with goalkeepers in um, hockey, uh, field hockey, and, and in hurling and camogie. So I can see that. I actually think, it, and it's one of the, the, the points I, I may have omitted earlier, in the modern game of football, the goalkeeper is much more than a shot stopper, and they're heavily involved in the control and passing game, especially with particular team styles. And I think that's where it feeds back into the question we had earlier from uh, particular game environments or, or areas of the pitch. Uh, goalkeepers will get a massive benefit from a scanning and heads up perspective in these as well and it may actually be something that goalkeepers who aren't used to having to control and pass the football under pressure which we see in countless Premier League games when there's an absolute howler of a goal given away from a keeper who could not identify or get a pass off quickly enough they might be very effective too from that perspective Mm -hmm. which is guess because that actually answers one of the questions that was sent in by Lindsay do you have any ideas as how the goals might be used by goalkeepers? <laughs> so, one, of the, one that was sent in earlier. Um, uh, I, we're, I, we've got two, three minutes left, so let me see if there's any here. Uh, Stu sent in the question, uh, is there more or less benefit, I think you've actually answered, answered, in your opinion, of the goggles from one position or another, attacker versus defender? And I think you showed that in that slide earlier from, let's say, those corner cornerback positions, for want of a better phrase, um, but also in the midfield across there, are there particular positions in your opinion Al that you feel the goggles would be better served for the kind of scanning properties that they may may engage with behaviorally in their in their in their play yeah I mean I, I think in from from a from a kind of a commercial standpoint almost they, they're almost a central midfielder's initial thought process of people think oh yeah our, our central midfielder needs to be able to keep his head up and needs to be able to scan because they act as such a pivotal player within that setting. But to, to say that it's only for a central midfielder, I think you'd lose a massive amount of opportunities with your goalkeeper in the example I gave a minute ago, which are left back or your right back or your left winger or your right winger. It's just about understanding the position, the positional awareness that those players need to use them in and then working from there. Right. Uh, a question here that I think we again answered. Any idea, came from Chris, any idea about the Goggles used in a rehab setting. So I think we'd cover that with the monster. Yeah. Uh, the, the discussion we used to have with the, the rehab team, the medical team there previously. And one last question on my end here. Any other sports or sporting actions that the goggles are possibly useful for? Again, I think we've covered quite a few of those options already. If you have any more. Yeah, I, I suppose just to, to some of the sports I've used them in most um, is martial arts, uh, which is quite interesting from a combat perspective. Um, especially with kids and it's always fun to use them with the kids because kids when they progress through early stages of of combat sparring in, in taekwondo anyway from from my own knowledge is they start with hand sparring and then they integrate them into hand and foot sparring but kids are so focused on looking down at the foot that they often get punched in the head um so from that perspective they work really well and they start to get the kids to look at the trunk which is going to give them way more information in relation to how they can pick up cues for a kick attack or a hand attack as opposed to looking at the feet and getting punched in the head um, and then obviously as you scale that up you can manipulate the task a little nice well that's nice that's a nice uh, thing uh one final oh, couple of final, a quick question about the price list would it change because of brexit now uh, look i don't think Brexit's is going to go ahead man don't worry about it <laughs> <laughs> as GB and Europe are separate at the minute on the price list uh, again that, that we what we can do is we can relay that back to I suppose James who's 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 in charge of the company but uh, again I'm not too sure what how much thought has gone into that and uh, we were always hopeful here that that wouldn't uh, I wouldn't proceed because we, we kind of liked hanging out with G in the same team um but yeah um but uh, again I would say probably Probably not. You nod or shake your head, James. I, I can't see there being much because of the the low price range. It is you're 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 muted at the moment, James. Yeah. Can can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, it's actually something that I have checked out and I haven't got a definite answer for. But like that, it is it is it's highly unlikely that it's going to have any any effect on it. Okay. Cool. It's, it's what I'm told, but I haven't got a definite answer yet. Right. There's right. a lot of different answers still to be gotten. Make, make, make sure, make sure Nick gets a special price anyway. Um, Absolutely. Well, anybody here tonight will will, will, will be will be offered special <laughs> price in the contact. Just uh, that, Ed, I just have just because you were you were speaking about the goggles, so I have them here. Right. So as you can see, they're actually quite robust. You can't you can't break them, and um, and that's why they come with a lifetime guarantee. 
the only way to actually break these is to actually physically get something and cut it. That's the only way. They can't be broken. Um, and strapped in is adjustable, so it's one, it's one size fits all. So it's, it's, been, it's a once-off it's a once off purchase. You won't have to buy them again. Great, thanks, James. It's just a, a question came in there from Gavin Fleming. It's actually quite a yes, good yes, question. Yes. If Our you, last you question, want, I'd say. You'll indulge me with one more answer. Um, yeah. So, final one. Um, from a, a tactical perspective, uh, on top of scanning and decision making, in terms of integrating the goggles with those, there's there's some really nice uh, research on contextual priors, um, which is essentially if I can understand uh, what a player likes to typically do. So if you take Iron, Iron Robin, who everybody would have known as the player who cut in off the right-hand side and scored countless goals with his left leg. If I can layer information like that into my preparation to a team playing Bayern Munich per se, and I can use the goggles to force a player to try and pick up on the cues of a player who's going to cut in constantly, you may start to give them more context in terms of what they need to see from that particular player or from that particular perspective. Um, so that's where that kind of a tactical element adds in from a contextual prior or prior information about a particular opponent can help quite a lot uh, within those. And that's on top of the, 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 the scanning and decision-making perspective. Cool. Okay, guys, um, look, uh, we want to be strong on time, as you said, so it's two minutes past eight now, so I'm happy to wrap it up. As I said, Alan showed our details on there. I, I know Alan uh, I know Alan well, and I, he's like myself, we're happy to engage with people beyond this if people have any questions, research-wise, empirically, or even from a practical perspective. Thanks again to James for, for hosting this evening, and I uh, really appreciate the interaction, guys. It was, it was a really cool hour. So am I, from me, thank you very much, Alan, to you. Yeah, no, thank you very much for the uh, the engagement. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to engage in anybody who has any follow-up questions or any thoughts on it. Also, I'd love to hear uh, how people who potentially have them use them because yeah. it's always fascinating. I've got a couple of ideas from the questions that have come yeah. in here. So <laughs> anybody has any other information, please uh, pile it on. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. And thanks everyone else for, for joining us this evening. Bye now. Cheers, guys. Thanks, guys. James, you might just stay on a moment there.